All right. So there's been a lot of press and excitement around AI. Can one of you, both of you, um, give us your thoughts on the st state of AI now and where it's going in the next five, 10, maybe 20 years? And even further, what do you think will be the most eye-opening advancement? So I've, I've been saying for four years now, AI is a new electricity. And I think over the last several years, we've made tremendous progress. The number of jobs created, the number of applications, amounts of revenue companies are building, just all many trends are up and to the right. Um, and I think that momentum continues. But if you look at what we've done so far, I think we've transformed the software industry. Companies like Google and other tech companies that you see around this area are very good at using AI. Um, and now it's beyond just a handful of the largest companies. Many software internet companies, you know, including recent IPOs, Stars of Europe, our, soft, our industry is very good at using AI. One of the things I'm most excited about is for us to now go and transform the rest of those other industries. Um, everything from manufacturing to agriculture to healthcare to transportation logistics. We, we live in a little bit of a bubble um, here in Silicon Valley, but most of the economy is not, you know, the software internet industry. And um, having kind of helped the software internet industry do this, uh, there's still more work to be done, you know, still a lot more great projects uh, at, at Google and, and companies like Google that should be done. But I, I, I love to see the whole economy, you know, even more of the world transform with AI so that we can use this to make really a lot of humanity more powerful, more effective. Um, and as part of doing that, with the last wealth of creation, really the rise of the internet, I think we created a lot of wealth, um, which is great, but we also contributed to, to wealth and equality. And I hope that this next time round, with this next wave of wealth creation that we will do using AI, um, we can take everyone along with us. And I think part of that is the democratization of AI knowledge and AI tools, which TensorFlow has been a huge contributor to. Yeah, and uh, totally agree. And for me, part of my passion, as Alina mentioned earlier on, is really software developers. And I think in order to be able to build the world that Andrew was envisioning, you know, software developers are going to be the front line in doing that. So where I would like to see AI in 5, 10, 15 years or whatever would be that, um, how many of us, by the way, identify as a software developer here, just out of interest? Okay, most of the room, cool. Uh, so that uh, those of us who are software developers would have AI as a normal part of our toolkit in the same way as anything else is. The same way as understanding SQL to access databases or understanding, you know, uh, presentation layer versus coding layers like in, in web and understanding high level languages like Java or C sharp or Swift or those type of things that it would just be something that's much more normalized as part of our toolkit. And I think when that's something that becomes normalized in our toolkit, that's when we'll be able to build the things that can take advantage of AI very quickly. And um, it's amazing when you start thinking about the scenarios of problems that we all solve on a daily basis, how much we can improve those um, with AI techniques. Yeah. Just to build on something Laura said, um, I remember <clears throat> Jeff Hinton once mentioned to me that today we have a, we have a lot of software engineers, we write programs to tell computers what to do. Um, Jeff mentioned that in the future, you know, maybe we need equal numbers of people programming computers as showing computers or using machine learning. And I don't know if in the further future, 10 years, um, if the ratio will be 50-50 or some other ratio. But, um, uh, you know, Stanford's PhD program, over 50% of the applicants want to work on AI. And I don't think it's unrealistic if in the relatively further future, we have you know, equal numbers of people using programming types of techniques as machine learning techniques. And it would be an exciting world if a large fraction, maybe 50%, I don't know, of software engineering was machine learning based. Um, mm -hmm. It was actually interesting that like what Andrew was sharing as well is that when we started off building the course that we're working on, um, I shared a statistic um, as to why I wanted like us to think about shaping the course the way that we did. And there were various surveys out there by people like Stack Overflow and EDC that talk about the number of developers in the world. And it's usually like in the high 20 million, 27, 28, 29, 30 million. And then there was a survey done by Baidu in China about AI practitioners, and there were 300,000. And so it's like, we were saying like, if we can help a significant percentage, like say 10% of those 30 million software developers become trained in AI and ML, 
we will 10x the number of AI practitioners that are out there. And uh, I find that's like, to me, that's particularly inspirational. So if you end up in a few years' time, two, three years' time with 3 million AI practitioners as opposed to 300,000, think about all the things that they're going to be able to do. Think about all the new solutions that we'll have. So you jump directly into my next question. <laughs> There's a huge sh a shortage of AI professionals right now. I know that both of you are teaching courses and putting content out there. Can you talk a little bit about what this will basically do to act to actually improve that a ratio sure. that you just mentioned? Online courses, uh, online videos, Lawrence a lot of YouTube videos as well. Um, I think this knowledge is very helpful. Maybe I'll just mention one thing that's less widely known, which is the importance of enterprises in driving this type of education. So many of you I know have been signing up for the tensile specialization, for deep learning specialization, things like that, and that's great. Um, one of the trends I'm seeing strongly is that more and more companies are facilitating having huge numbers, sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands of people um, learn these things um, uh, sort of at the same time. Um, a few weeks ago, I was talking to uh, uh, this group from a company that about 2,000 employees, and they were getting every single employee starting to get every single employee to take AI for everyone, which is an interesting thing to do. Um, and I think when a community of people like that in a company um, signs up to learn TensorFlow or learn about these tools, you can dramatically accelerate the rate at which a company is able to embrace these tools, and that's one exciting trend. You know, actually, since, since I'm back here at Google, I remember when very early days of Google Brain, uh, first thing I did was actually teach a class in Google on deep learning. And so we met once per week, and I think something like 50 engineers showed up every week. You know, we had them watch some videos that they created at Stanford, and then they would listen to me, uh, and sometimes others, sometimes Jeff Dean, sometimes others, talk about machine learning. But we could do that because, you know, Google had good machine learning people, or you know, a few of us were already there. Um, the th one of the ways the world has changed is that even if a company does not currently have uh, Lawrence as an employee, well, they can get Lawrence <laughs> in digital format. Uh, <laughs> and I think that is a, is a wonderful change that will really accelerate a lot of companies' adoption of AI. Yeah, and it's um, things such as like what Andrew was saying, and uh, going back to the, the question you were asking about um, empowering people in learning AI. To me, one of the great advantages of it is, um, is anybody familiar with the Gartner hype cycle? Have you seen it's like it's, so it's a curve. I see a lot of hands. It's a, it's a curve that starts with a technology trigger, and then it goes up to something called the peak of inflated expectations, and then it falls into the trough of disillusionment before it rises again into the plateau of productivity. And uh, like with AI right now, it's like there's so much of this hype and this peak of inflated expectations that what I love, like when you were saying for AI for everybody, going to everybody in a company and not just the engineers. It helps those in the company break through those inflated expectations, that they can understand what AI is, what it does, what machine learning is, what machine learning does, and set realistic expectations for it. And I often joke that my job at Google is to help people tunnel through that curve to go straight to the trough of disillusionment. So I'm a professional disillusioner. <laughs> you know? um, but, it, it, but it's once you reach that point that productivity really begins. And there's a famous saying that those who don't learn from history are condemned to repeat it. And I always like to think about, if you remember when the smartphone first came out, when Steve Jobs went on stage and said, one more thing, and then he introduced the iPhone, the world hit this peak of inflated expectation. Everybody was going to throw away their laptop. Everybody was going to throw away their desktop. All you'd ever need is a phone. Um, all your compute could be done on that. And then people got the devices, and they realized their restrictions. They were amazing, powerful devices, but the restrictions of the smaller screen, of a touch interface, of only being able to one, run one app at a time, the world fell into the trough of disillusionment. But then out of that productivity road, and new scenarios came out of it. It's like one that I always like to uh, give an example of a company is like Uber and Lyft. You know, once upon a time, you know, you would tell people that you don't talk to strangers on the internet and you don't get into strangers' cars. Now we literally summon strangers from the internet and get into their car. But it's become a really, really convenient thing. That app scenario became really possible because of that trough of disillusionment rising into the plateau of productivity. And I think as more and more AI gets seeded in the enterprise and things like Andrew's AI for everybody, 
becomes something for everybody. And business decision makers, as well as technical decision makers, the human resources people, the CEOs of the company are learning more about what it is. Then they can start really becoming realistic about what they can do with it. And that's when, to me, the exciting things begin to happen. So since you both mentioned education, how pe people basically need to learn to move into these amazing fields, right, and uh, move the industry along, um, can you both talk about the a, the a new course and your favorite part 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 of the course, maybe content-wise or? Okay, can I start this one? <laughs> My favorite part of the course is that um, before every lesson, Andrew and I have a conversation about it, where we get to kind of geek out about what it is that we're talking about, be it convolutions or natural language processing and all that kind of stuff. And that's something that for me has really helped shape how um, the rest of the world sees AI. And like, Andrew just has this magnificent vision for AI for the world and like, I suffer from massive imposter syndrome during those conversations, but I always come away from them feeling a little bit smarter. So they're, they're my favorite part of the course. And he gave me a mug as well. And anybody who gives me a mug is a winner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, you're too kind. You know, um, one of my most memorable moments, um, uh, I'll, I'll tell a story and then tell the generalizable lesson, was when um, one day out of the blue, Lauren slacked me, sent me a message with a, um, uh, uh, Irish poem generated by an LSTM that started, you know, Andrew sang a sad old song, and then it went into Irish lyrics. Uh, with, hey diddly diddlies and nonny knows. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I think uh, it was cool, you know, it was a good LSTM generated, uh, uh, Lawrence had trained it on, what, 80, 80, 80, 80 Irish songs, songs yeah. and then used an LSTM to generate very weird Irish song lyrics. Um, and I thought that was cool. Well, for, 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 for two reasons. Um, I had never imagined that one of the benefits of working on AI is, you know, is like, don't do AI just to work on exciting projects or to have an impact in the world. Do it because you can also get customized Irish poetry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but one thing I've learned about AI is um, keep the fun in it as well. Um, you know, recently I met an engineer that uh, works for a large, that, that works for a travel agency. Um, and she had written, uh, actually a small team had written a piece of software using machine learning that generated um, customer greetings for guests. Right? I'm, I'm simplifying some detail to, to preserve. Uh, um, and the managers told them this doesn't generate, this was one of their company's first forays into machine learning. Um, it was like a fun hackathon project. <clears throat> it was, uh, um, and the managers actually went to them and said, look, this doesn't generate any revenue, stop doing this. And I really disagree with the approach of that particular management team because um, it's true that AI offers lots of great opportunities. If you have an idea for doing something huge, go and do that. But until you are ready to have that huge idea, um, much better to do something rather than nothing. And I see a lot of people start off by doing fun hackathon projects. Um, Lauren says a great rock, paper, scissors example yeah. in the course as well. And you know, you're not going to, uh, maybe you change the world by doing AI for rock, paper, scissors. Maybe not, but it's fine. Do it. It's fun. You enjoy it. And it's often by doing those fun projects that you gain the skills that allows you to practice to then, and the goal is not for you to be building rock, paper, scissors level apps for the next 10 years. It's for you to do that homework exercise, learn to do the small thing. It run, and actually, that exercise runs in a web browser. Yeah. It's actually really cool. Uh, and then over time, learn to do bigger and bigger projects so that if in two years, you then see an opportunity to do something that helps, you know, 10 million people or something, that you've now practiced the skills of data collection, data cleaning, modeling, deployment, debugging after post-production, uh, post-deployment, that lets you then do those big opportunities later. So, so just encourage you, do the fun stuff in machine learning too. Uh, do the large serious projects if you can, but until then, Give respect to the people doing the fun hackathon projects too, because that's how we grow as a community. Great. Um, I actually have a very specific question about the the course. Okay. Why does it focus on Keras and not TensorFlow? Okay, that's a great question. Um, can I take that one, Andrew? Uh, so uh, there's a very specific reason. Um, I wouldn't exactly say it focuses on one over the other. It's more Keras is now part of TensorFlow. And with TensorFlow 2, one of the things that we really wanted to do was democratize AI, make it a lot easier, and particularly for developers to learn how to build machine learning and deep learning applications. Earlier, I mentioned the 300,000 number and the 30 million number. 
Uh, the 300,000 number are people who are very familiar with graphs and very familiar with low-level ops. The 30 million number are not. And so in order to give them a smooth on-ramp to AI, machine learning, deep learning, do things like convolutional neural networks and write Irish songs with LSTMs, Keras is really, really powerful for that. So the early courses focus on using the high-level APIs in TensorFlow 2 that are Keras-based. Um, it's not a case of it's a choice of one over the other. It's just the case of as, as you do the early stuff and as you want ramp to this, we find it's a lot easier for developers to be able to build things relatively quickly and build powerful and fun things relatively quickly using Keras. Um, as we create more modules in the course, we've got a very long plan for this, for a lot of stuff. Then later on, we're going to be going into the deeper APIs, into the graph-based stuff, into the more research-oriented stuff. But um, I do want to allay that it's not a case of we're choosing Keras over TensorFlow. It's just really Keras is part of TensorFlow, and it's a, a tool that I think has helped make TensorFlow a lot easier to get started with. Um, how would you oh, recommend that somebody com completely new to AI get started and get going? Can I start with this one, yeah, Andrew? Because so, um, I started by doing his course. And so <laughs> when we first met to talk about this course, I told him that. I think I embarrassed him a little. Oh, I didn't realize he'd done that. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. So, so Andrew has some terrific courses online. There's the Stanford, is it CS231B? Or CS231A? 229? Oh, I yeah. never remember the number, sorry. Oh, I see. But yeah. so that course was terrific for me to understand and demystify a lot of the concepts in machine learning. You know, it's where well, I started reading a lot of papers and I started reading a lot of tutorials and they started talking about things like, hey, you need a, a really good loss function or you really need a really good optimizer. And as a coder, I was like, why? And I didn't understand and I didn't understand how these worked. And there'd be things like, and all those, those acronym soup, CNN, RNN, LSTM. It's like, I just didn't understand all of that. So for me, that's actually how I got started and inspired on the, the journey that I'm on. Funny story is I actually did AI like 30 years ago when I was in college. And AI back then was Prolog and Lisp. Anybody ever study those languages? Anybody ever wear out the bracket keys on their keyboard doing Lisp code? If you've ever programmed in Lisp, it's literally bracket, 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 piece of code, bracket, bracket, bracket. It's, it's really strange. Anyway, I digress. Uh, so um, I moved away from AI, and then in the last few years, I've moved back into AI. And that was the first thing that got me started, to really see the, how things have advanced and how powerful they are. And I'd strongly recommend that to anybody. And then what we wanted to do with this course, then, was to help people who are developers to get started by having something that really meshes with that, that's oriented towards coders. So Andrew's content, um, the deep learning.ai specialization, all that kind of stuff to really help you understand what machine learning is on the inside. And then something that complements that for coders to say, okay, now you want to build a convolutional neural network. You know what convolutions are. You know how they work. Here's the code for a convolutional neural network. And here's some practical examples on classifying rock, paper, scissors, or classifying fraction items, and that kind of thing, with the hope that when these two mesh together, that they will really help people become experts in it. So that's my recommendation for getting started. Do both. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like you know the, the, the courses that we're creating, uh, Deep Learning AI, Lawrence, some of the earlier things we did at Stanford, um, think of them like Pokemon. You really want to collect them all. Um, <laughs> But, but, Who's going to be first to tweet that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But 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 I, I think that um, uh, actually some some of the you know non people with other technical backgrounds that would be for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, the machine learning course um, uh, out of Stanford uh, uh, is still a common on ramp. It's actually the I think over two point five million people have enrolled in that. I think it's probably the largest on ramp to machine learning. In the world still today, the deep learning specialization, the new TensorFlow specialization. I think there are complementary skills that will teach you different mixes of applied versus, um, uh, you know, deeper uh, theoretical knowledge. And I think they, all of these things, uh, hopefully, will contribute to your being a successful machine learning engineer. That's great. So I want to switch gears a little bit and ask both of you about what recent ad advancements in in AI are you most ex excited about? Oh, um, I wasn't expecting that question. I'll, I'll, I'll mention one that maybe isn't widely known, but that I'm excited about, uh, which is um, self-supervised learning. Um, uh, so you, may have, you, you know about supervised learning, learning with label data. You may have heard of unsupervised learning. You know, algorithms like k-means, some autoencoders, GANs, learning from unlabeled data. There's this weird thing in between self-supervised learning 
which is when you take unlabeled data and make up labels um, uh, and feed that into supervised learning algorithm. So word embeddings is one example of, supervised, of a self-supervised learning where you take unlabeled English corpora, hide a word, and have the algorithm predict the missing word. And this is great for learning word embeddings. But um, in computer vision, there are now sort of made up tasks, such as um, I can take a picture, uh, cut it into you know, a three by three grid. Uh, this is called the jigsaw task, right? Take a picture, um, cut it into nine pieces, shuffle it, so nine factorial permutations, and have the algorithm try to figure out what was the original permutation of these you know, nine pieces. Uh, and so called the jigsaw task, this is one of many, many examples. So another one. I'm going to take a picture, randomly rotate it, so I can do this with unlabeled data, and I ask you to predict what was the original rotation of this image. So, oh, sorry, people are having time. Maybe I should use a handheld. Yeah, there you go. Let's try to speak up. Um, <clears throat> so these are all very clever examples of ways to make up label tasks uh, for supervised learning, and it turns out when you do these things, both for NLP and computer vision, and a little bit increasingly other domains as well, this allows you to learn a hidden representation uh, that can be transferred or whatever to many other tasks. So I think you know, it's always a little bit hard to predict what's coming down the pipe. I think uh, supervised learning is not going to run on Steam for a long time, frankly. If, if we just use supervised learning, there's so many applications that we could build that would be very valuable that have not yet been built. But if you look at technologies that are a little bit further down, um, uh, I think I'm very excited. And uh, at ICML, uh, International Conference for Machine Learning, I spent a whole day just listening in on the self-supervised learning workshop. But that's this is actually one technology that some people are hearing about that um, has not yet hit the limits of scale. So a lot of research groups are just trying to find more data, faster computers to do this. And I'm excited about the potential uh, about to let us use more unlabeled data. Uh, this is just one weird thing I happen to know about. <laughs> It seems too early to call. Maybe RNNs had a little bit of hype cycle that Lawrence mentioned, and it's not as hyped anymore. But um, uh, I think if you want to capture long-term dependencies, I think they're still a wonderful tool. Um, yeah. And, and attention is not going to fill that. I think attention, I, I feel like attention was a brilliant mechanism, was a brilliant idea. Um, uh, uh, I think that, uh, I, yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, ideas like uh, attention built, was, which was actually built on top of RNNs, right, in many of the early instantiations, or transformer nets um, uh, done at scale still seem like very promising classes of tools. One of the hardest things to do in today's world is still scoping good AI projects, right? So when, whether you're a startup or whether you're a team in a big company, to identify the valuable use cases that, that has to meet two criteria simultaneously. One, the engineers have to really build it. Uh, because of the hype about AI, sometimes they're over the elevated expectations, like, oh, maybe we'll have, you know, um, chatbots. They can have fully general purpose conversations and talk about anything. Well, we, we just don't know how to do that today. Uh, uh, but so realistic expectations about what you can build, do you have enough data, what's the engineering timeline to execute that on, that's, that's one. And second is a, is a business validation. If you build this learning algorithm, will this actually help a manufacturing client uh, improve yield and improve efficiency? Or will this actually help a agricultural machinery so that when a farmer drives it, more crop comes out of the back? Or um, will this actually help uh, radiologists diagnose X-ray faster and a comparable higher accuracy, but do that business validation. So when my teams are brainstorming projects, we will often brainstorm multiple ideas. When, actually, when we work with a large company, we may brainstorm, say, half a dozen ideas. And then for each of the ideas, we subject it to sometimes a small number of weeks of technical diligence, where we validate the idea is technically feasible, as well as business diligence, where we build conviction, where we try to you know, figure out if this idea really is valuable before we um, execute the idea. And I think that's true both for startups as well as um, uh, for large projects that one might want to do in a company. Uh, yes, wow. I think knowledge drop is one of those AI technologies that is widely used, very powerful within large companies like Google and, and, and a few others. Um, 
but that the PR it gets or the amount of academic interest it gets seems significantly smaller than its actual utility. And I think, you know, frankly, despite all the excitement about deep learning, I love deep learning. Uh, not everything should be done with deep learning. And um, if you don't have a lot of data, you need to cut up more prior knowledge. Uh, and I think the best AI teams don't use deep learning for everything. I think the best AI teams have a portfolio of techniques uh, ranging from, you know, deep learning, but sometimes, you know, sometimes you use XG boost, right? And sometimes you use uh, unsupervised, actually, I, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, my teams and I were sitting down and debugging some things out of PCA, right? And we're looking at the residuals from PCA and trying to figure out what's going on. Um, to probably graphical models, to knowledge graph, to these other tools. And so I think the best AI teams actually have a portfolio of techniques uh, and then choose the right tool for the right job. Um, uh, I think actually one of the things, uh, I think you, you, I think Lawrence mentioned uh, deep learning specialization in addition to TensorFlow specialization. One of the things that the deep learning specialization does is um, teach the strategy of machine learning, including, for example, when should you use an end-to-end -end deep learning algorithm? Sometimes it works great, but sometimes you should not use that. So one of the very practical things that deep learning specialization teaches is um, strategies for designing neural network architectures so that in addition to the coding, which the TensorFlow specialization gets you into very quickly, you, un you have the conceptual framework um, to understand the algorithms at a deeper level and then also make these strategic choices. I've seen a lot of machine learning teams, um, you know, choose the wrong, make the wrong uh, strategic decision, just pursue the wrong approach, such as use end-to-end use -end deep learning when they should be building a knowledge drop or whatever. Mm -hmm. And when you make the wrong strategic decision, it's very easy for a team to burn six months and get nowhere. And then sometimes someone, you know, and then sometimes uh, uh, you know, someone like Lawrence or me goes to the team and says, hey, why don't you, you know, just build a knowledge graph there, use PCA there, and they dramatically accelerate their progress. So I think it's important to have those strategies, right, in addition to the coding. Um, so, so machine learning, yearning, the deep learning specialization teach you those things uh, uh, in addition to the, to, the, to the mechanics of coding that you get from, from the, and you also need to be good at coding. And I think it's an attribute of the hype cycle, right? Where it's like, you know, hey, machine learning fixes everything, can cure everything. Let, let's apply machine learning. And managers who don't know anything about AI and machine learning say, we'll make our product better by putting machine learning in it and that kind of stuff. So I think once we bust through that hype cycle and there are the skills out there um, to be able to determine when it should be used, when it shouldn't be used, I think things will get a lot better. We'll be at the trough of disillusionment heading upwards in the plateau of productivity. But I actually really love what you were just saying about the fact that you know, uh, deep learning algorithms or models that you build are just classifying images or labeling images. It's like, for a lot of people, that's the end product. Um, but it's a case, when you start looking at innovative solutions, like you're talking about that that feeds a knowledge graph, that's when the real fun begins, I think. Like the example I spoke about earlier on, like instead of a device that just says, this is a butterfly, and tells a kid that it's a butterfly, the kid already knows it's a butterfly, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, but can actually craft that into an overall product that helps them tell a story later on. That's when it begins to get exciting. And just going back to, there was a question earlier about like five, 10, 15 years from now. To me, it's like that when machine learning and deep learning become part of the programmer's regular toolbox instead of a magical solution in and of its own right, that those kind of really cool things happen. So I'm, I'm curious to learn more about what you're doing because that sounds really exciting. You know, I'll, I'll mention one, one weird thing I noticed. Uh, a couple of years ago, I used to go into rooms. Uh, uh, you said, you know, machine learning is not magic, right? So mm -hmm. a few years ago, when I was speaking to CEO audiences, I'd go into the room and sometimes say, hey, everyone, nice to meet you. And then I would actually say, you know, just so you know, machine learning is not magic. I would say those words. <laughs> and the surprising thing was I saw everyone around the table relax a little bit. Right? <laughs> and, and we somehow hyped it up so much that that's even worth saying. And, so, so, so you could try that, I guess, with, with, with your CS. <laughs> um, I'm going to plug my YouTube channel. <laughs> if you go to TensorFlow, oh, sorry, youtube.com slash TensorFlow, there was a talk from Google I.O. this year about federated learning that I'd, I'd strongly recommend that you look at. For the rest of us, just in summary, the idea behind federated learning is that uh, devices like your Android device are not really suited for training models on but they are very good at generating data that models can be trained from. And often it's a collection of people who have data in a collected environment, like maybe the garbage cans environment I mentioned earlier on. 
that can generate data that can dial home to a central server that can retrain and then can download models to those devices in a connected scenario is really the, the, the big idea behind federated learning. And we've realized that it's something that very important for us to continue working on. And, you know, um, I'll just check out that I.O. talk for more details on it. If I'm not mistaken, there's a really good a blog post. Oh yeah, we got on one. on this. Okay, that's a cartoon that lay, lays everything out. Okay, blog.tensorflow.org okay. is uh, where it is. Yeah. And, there was another part of the question. Yeah. Differential. No, price. Yeah, and let, let me just uh, even further, let, let me describe to you one of the exciting trends um, that is coming through machine learning, which is that um, <clears throat> edge devices have been you know getting more and more compute at a relatively fast rate. Uh, cloud has been growing compute as well at a different Moore's law type of rate. And the network bandwidth is also getting faster, but at yet another different Moore's law. Um, and beyond edge and cloud, there's also starting to be, you know, fog computing or these other servers like a compute in your, um, uh, in your local network interchange or compute in your Wi-Fi router. But we're starting to see these multiple tiers of uh, compute devices uh, from the cloud to fog to edge. And because these Moore's law are improving at different rates, uh, uh, both in compute and in networking, it feels like every year, um, sometimes it feels like every year we're rebalancing what workload to do where based on the trade-offs of you know, latency versus aggregating data from multiple users to get better performance or whatever. So it's actually very complicated and very dynamic. And, and the dynamism is driven because these different Moore's law are advancing it at different speeds. Um, uh, so that'll be something exciting to, to, to watch out for. Um, and differential privacy, I think, you know, I think uh, I give, um, I guess Apple deserves a lot of credit for kicking off that conversation, even if at that time the technology was relatively mature, but it is actually starting to work. So for example, I think, um, what was it? Uh, uh, Don Song at Berkeley and Uber working together did some work showing that you could train language models from data, where if you add noise in the right way, you can train very good language models that uh, do not you know, make it as easy for someone to recover like a social security number that was in the text that was used to train the language model. So um, I think differential privacy starts it off with like a little bit of, you know, hype, but, but I do see road traction. And I think, so I think it's encouraging that tools like differential privacy are starting to work well enough that when companies want to put in these things as safeguards for privacy, that there's starting to be more options. So it turns out that uh, uh, there are many different skills that successful machine learning practices should have. And it depends on the company as well as on the role. Um, I think there are some, to, to, give, to give you an example of portfolio of skills, um, I think that uh, a lot of attention is on the modeling skill, how to choose the right network architecture, choose the right model, how to code up on TensorFlow uh, or code, code up in whatever framework, that's important. Um, I think that uh, general software engineering skills are also important and sometimes a little bit underappreciated by some, some of the machine learning community. You know, after you build a model in Jupyter Notebook, right, there's still a huge gap uh, between what runs on your laptop uh, in Jupyter Notebook versus something you can deploy. And so the software engineering skills, as well as the practical you know, engineering deployment skills are important. Um, uh, I think that for very large data sets, you need strong data engineering skills as well, depending on exactly where you want to deploy the ability to you know, do programming at the edge, uh, even, even real time embedded is important. Um, uh, and then if you end up doing more data science work where the goal is less to have a running AI system, but to you know, produce a set of business insights, then statistics analysis skills are also important. So one of the um, AI, it actually encompasses a lot of things. And I think people with many things in this portfolio of skills tend to do better. Oh, and also within AI, you know, don't just learn deep learning, uh, learn also, you know, other things, uh, in other things in machine learning or things like knowledge graphs we talked about, probably graphical models, uh, specialized skills in computer vision, specialized skills in NLP, maybe even specialized skills in robotics or other sectors. So depending on, th there's actually a lot to learn and your portfolio of skills will make you more or less qualified for different specific roles because there may be a job in a company that needs more computer vision expertise but less NLP expertise and or needs more big data engineering because the data sets are massive versus other things. And I, I think I'd add to that there's the traditional software development skills of understanding where your stuff gets deployed 
So like being able to understand to scale out to the enterprise, you know, when you build your model or when you build the stuff that wraps your model, how do you scale that out? How do you build that so that you can serve a billion users instead of a thousand test users, that type of thing. But there's also one really important one that tends to be um, overlooked and that in any software engineering, not just uh, deep learning and AI, and that's being good at requirements analysis and understanding the requirements of your end user and understanding the requirements of your customer. And I think in some ways that also gets expanded somewhat in AI because uh, AI and machine learn stuff are very data driven and it's very easy to overfit to the data that you have and not just be able to, and not be able to deliver what your end user needs or what your end user wants. And there's the B word, can I use the B word? Bias. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of discussion around bias in AI and I think it's, a really, really good skill for a software engineer or an AI engineer or an AI practitioner to be able to spot that before it goes out. And it's like, that's one of the, the to me, one of the newfound skills that's out there. And I like to tell a funny story about that, but who has done the, the uh, convolutions part of our course and has done the rock, paper, scissors exercise? A few? Okay, not many. Okay, so the, for the rock, paper, scissors exercise, I generated a data set of 840 rock, 840 paper, and 840 scissors. Well, let me just do a quick survey. How would you do scissors? Just hold your hands up and do scissors. Okay. I see one person who does it like me. <laughs> so oh, somebody does that. That's a first <laughs> <That's> <laughs> over there. <laughs> I haven't never seen it like that before. But like, I grew up in Ireland and in the UK where this is a rude gesture. So I do scissors like this, like you did. Now, are you from the UK? No. Yeah, and it's, it's like, you know, it's a, so I do scissors like this, but almost everybody does it with the thumb in. But if you take a look at the data set that I created for that, it was one person created the, the data set, and I brought my implicit bias along with me, because every image in the data set with scissors is like this. <laughs> and most of you did scissors with the thumb in. And so it's, it's a silly example, and it's a trivial example, but it also shows how easy bias can creep in. And when you're building something that's data driven in the same way as this is, having the skill to be able to spot biases like that, I think is a very, very important skill that will help you downstream because you don't want to deliver a model that will eventually cause offense or cause problems by delivering a model because you delivered it with your implicit bias along with it. In my case, it's relatively harmless. I did a talk at Google I.O. where I um, did the rock, paper, scissors example. And then afterwards, like, you know, somebody kind of was in the crowd and I was answering some questions and they just went, who does scissors like that? And, I was, and I, I, that's how I learned about the problem. <laughs> you know? so nobody told me. And so I think, you know, being able to spot bias and being able to like understand the needs of your customers and to avoid bias and uh, problems that can come as a result of bias is also a super, super important skill uh, to, to learn. Um, you know, I think that uh, academia and corporations are both great places to advance uh, machine learning. I've you know, done both. Well, one of the nice things is that what used to be accessible only to the giant tech companies is now uh, much more widely accessible. In fact, so let's see, again, all right, since I'm here at Google, one of the first projects I led uh, was the slightly infamous Google Cat, where we used 16,000, you know, Google's cloud CPUs to learn to recognize the cat from YouTube. Um, and it was a big deal at the time, right? Made the front page, the New York Times website. And, and uh, uh, so it was a big deal at the time. Now you could log into a cloud service, swipe your credit card, pay about $2,000 uh, and replicate an experiment. So what used to be a big deal, even for you know, large tech companies is now accessible. Even uh, it's not like $2,000 is cheap. You know, that's the real money, but it's much more widely accessible. Um, and second, I think that while scale is one way to drive progress, I, uh, BERT, uh, XLNet, uh, GPT-2, all of these were great examples of, you know, using many ideas that were, you know, uh, uh, published, right, uh, and, and somewhat known, and scaling it much bigger and showing dramatic improvements in results just by scaling up data and compute. Like, it's encouraging that we've not yet exhausted that particular <laughs> engine for growth. Um, but I think that there are plenty of, um, paths for algorithmic innovation. I think a lot of research on small data really doesn't need that much scale. Uh, so I think the things you could do in academia and the things you can do in a large company are different. Uh, and, and maybe one example, one nice thing about uh, great universities is that you could do 
almost you know faculty can do almost anything right we feel like doing within you know with, with very wide latitude and so when um uh, for example when 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 at stanford is a fly autonomous helicopters i just did that I just didn't have to worry about revenue model or decided to work on ai for healthcare great partners on the same campus sometimes we can just talk to to form those interdisciplinary collaborations or decide to do ai for climate change and just very quickly move into these, these, these different sectors. And so I think the academic freedom of universities and the freedom to work on a lot of different problems, even if you don't necessarily have the data and compute resources. I, I've, I've been on both sides and love both sides. And I think both have unique strengths. All right. I think it's time for pizza. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Pine AI, you can't do Pine AI without pie. So. <laughs> Yep. We've got pizza pie and we've got sweet pie. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you guys. Thanks.